Well, welcome to everyone who has uh, joined us today for a California wildfires crisis opportunity. Uh, I'm Donnie Hazeltine, a Hoover Veteran Fellow um, here at the Hoover Institution. Um, all, with us today um, are our panelists, who I'll kick off and introduce here in just a moment. First of all, Dr. John Taylor. He's the George Schultz Senior Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution and the Marion Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University. Dr. Michael Wara is a Senior Research Scholar at the Woods Institute for the Environment and the Director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program. Chief Dave Winokur is the Fire Chief at the Morago Rinda Fire District and a Veteran Fellow at the Hoover Institution with myself. And I'm the Chief Security Officer at Xenon Partners and a Veteran Fellow working on the fire problem with Dave. We'll just kind of talk through the agenda here as we kick off and a little housekeeping. First of all, I'll start off with a little intro, just talking general and generally about the fire problem, specifically in California, and kind of the setup of how we arrived at some of the issues we want to talk about today. Uh, Dave is going to kick off and talk a little bit from the fire chief's perspective about um, fire science and how that impacts the situation. Then we'll have John discuss a little bit of basic economic principles and how rational choice and choice architecture influence this because how we our stakeholders aligned will often rely on some of those key economic theories and perspectives. And then we'll finish off with the initial part of the webinar with uh, Dr. Wara, who will talk about public policy and how that impacts us uh, to get positive change. We'll do a quick break. I'll run a moderated discussion amongst our three panelists, and then we'll open up to audience uh, questions and conclude. For the audience questions part, um, on Zoom here on the webinar, you'll have the Q&A option. So throughout the panel, go ahead and just type in your questions if you have them uh, or anything you want to pass to me. I'll see that and I will try to adjust as we go through and we'll probably start calling those questions out uh, once we get to the very end after that break. Um, with that, um, we'll go ahead and, uh, and kick off into the first uh, part of the uh, webinar. For an overview, I think the key thing we want you all to understand, you probably have seen this in the initial invite, is that in any given year, a Californian may be unlikely to experience direct wildfire loss to the home or property. But because of the way this environment is working out and because of the way um, fire is impacting both government, insurance industry, they are potentially going to have wildfire caused disruptions to the insurance market and have other after effects. Uh, you'll hear us say this a couple of times that fire is a little bit of an abstract problem, but there are a lot of things that tend to be more precise and focused problems like insurance that really push on the homeowners in Northern California. So we're going to explore how these elements are disrupting the fire insurance market and try to examine and discuss where there might be some positive opportunities for change. Because we think that when we bring together these elements between the fire science, the economics, the public policy, we feel by bringing those two, three perspectives in, uh, some opportunities will illuminate where we can move forward. So we are gonna examine the volatility of the fire insurance market specifically. We're gonna talk about some ways you might stabilize that. We're also trying to think a little bit more about how we view the landscape and try to make sure we're understanding. Because we found when we talk to people when we're doing uh, the research at Hoover, a lot of folks have a deep concern about the problem. A lot of folks have a piece of the problem. We want to try to make sure we're all seeing it from the same lens. So with that, uh, just for problem framing, it should be very obvious that wildfire is a severe threat, not just in California, but throughout the United States. Uh, large fire occurrences have been increasing and increasing. If you notice in the bottom right corner of the slide, you'll see this just came out in a recent New York Times article, which you may have seen, uh, with analysis by the First Street Foundation and the left, is kind of what they believe the current wildfire risk is to homes and structures in the United States. And fast forwarding 30 years based off increases in population, increases in fuel load, as well as increases in, um, in climate change and how weather is affecting that, you can see how things get a lot redder and a lot darker out there. Just looking in California, if we look collectively over time, up until 1917, the, the worst fire we had seen was 1991 Oakland Hills fire in terms of, of, of destructiveness to property. I want you to remember that for a second when we get on the next slide and start talking about insurance, uh, about that 1991 kind of flagship marker. The past few years, however, have gotten a lot worse. Uh, you can see the stats there for 2020 and 2021. Fires increase, they're covering larger acres, they're burning more structures, they're doing much more damage. So if you look collectively over the past 20 years, um, just on fire size alone, eight of the worst in California history and 12 of the top 20 happened in 2017 and 2022. If you look at just the most destructive fires, 13 of the top 20 most destructive fires happen in that five-year period as well. So as I mentioned, the things that kind of uh, align to that are, are climate change and changing weather patterns. It's increasing drought conditions in California. That's making, it's really priming the fuel that's on the ground for increased ignition. We also have issues of poor, poor forest land and land management, not just in California, but wider United States. 
uh, in the early 1900s, we came up with a policy that when we saw a forest fire, we were going to stop it by the next day, the next morning. And while that was incredibly successful and our fire suppression efforts have been very, very, very good, um, the side of that is fuels have not burned, which has allowed that understory to grow up, which really carries the fire. And then now we have increasing population and people moving into those areas, specifically in Northern California and throughout the Western United States, where you start seeing what's called the wildland urban interface. The mix of fuels and wild areas that can ignite and pass fire very, very quickly, and then urban environments and structures where you start seeing significant property damage. So when we think about expanding fire, expanding property damage, the one thing we all want is a safety net. And that safety net is usually insurance. However, unfortunately, as bleak as this looks with the fire picture, it looks pretty bad as well from the insurance angle. When we take a look at just the insurance perspective, when they look at catastrophic risk modeling, you can look on that table to the right and you can kind of see um, how that movement of profit compared to loss over time has gone. And I can jump ahead and kind of blow that up a little bit. If we look in the far left, you see that 1991 Oakland Hills fire that we had just talked about. So that started out, put them a little bit of loss, but if you think about that, that's kind of acceptably modeled over a period of time, a once in 20 year, once in 30 year fire. As you see that move along, we had positives and negatives throughout the time. And eventually around the 2003, 2004 area, insurance companies started making a profit then. Collectively across that period of time of almost 30 years, they got to an average annual profit of 390 million, cumulative profits of 10 billion. The market was healthy, it was moving forward. And then 2017 and 2018 hit. The losses just from those two years were about $20 billion. So effectively it uprooted almost all of their profits for the previous uh, 26 years. Because of that, because of their business, they had to struggle to rapidly figure out how a way forward. And oftentimes when we see organizations struggle with a catastrophic problem, we generally don't have the time and research to dig into and get up a really uh, detailed solution that's really gonna work well. So we come with a blunt instrument. And the blunt instrument that was initially used was looking at fire hazard severity zones and zip codes and taking a look at how fire had impacted those zip codes. If your fire hit your zip code, now we need to take a look at it from the risk standpoint, look at increasing premiums or potentially non-renewing your policy. When that started, the California government stepped in and said, that's gonna cause a significant pressure on homeowners and do significant damage to our economy. We need to do something. So they responded with an equally blunt instrument of saying, one year moratoriums on non-renewals and premium increases if fire hit your zip code. So now we have these two blunt objects hitting each other, which is just creating, creating volatility because it gives the insurance companies the only real decision they have is to leave the market. When they leave the market, now you're faced with buying incredibly high properties without insurance, which means you have to look at cash values. If you are a case where your home value is your net worth and you're looking at transferring it in intergenerational wealth to the next generation, that is impacted by your inability to have fire insurance and preserve that wealth that you gained over time in California. So your only option then is to go to the insurance of last resort, which is the fair plan. Um, that has been a great, uh, great plan and uh, to, to at least give someone some type of safety net. But the concern is, is it looks a little bit like we're seeing flood insurance back where I'm from in Louisiana and seeing how now it's shifting to a point where you're getting not the best insurance for a very, very high premium, but that's your only option out there. And like we expected as insurance left the market, as things changed, you began to see the fair plan uh, adoption increase over and over and over again. And now we're in a situation where we have a volatile market, a non-working insurance situation, people moving to the insurance of last resort, and none of this really changing the fire risk. So with that inter overview, it seems kind of bleak, but one of the things our research at Hoover has also brought out is we can probably boil down the stakeholders to three, right? The homeowners and communities, which live in California, the government, which includes both the fire, uh, fire departments and fire suppression, as well as insurance regulation and other types of aspect of regulation. And then the insurance industry, which also has a key part to play. And I think when you uh, read the newspapers and you look at the things coming out, a lot of times it can seem that these three stakeholders are, are diametrically opposed in certain areas. But while they have disagreements, what's critically important to understand is they all actually have the same ultimate goal, which is every single one of them wants to protect and limit the loss to life and property. They wanna mitigate the damage to fires. So in thinking about that, we can bring that together and look at the different things that they're concerned about. When you talk to homeowners, what are the three or four things that you're really worried about? When you talk to government, the same thing in the insurance industry, what are you concerned about? And we can see some of those things actually map to each other. And I think that gives us a lot of hope to perspective to thinking about where we can align these 
and where we can look for opportunities to potentially move the ball forward on, on this problem. So with that stage setting, I'm gonna go ahead and move over to Dave now uh, to talk a little bit about fire science and how that impacts the situation. Dave? Thank you, Donnie, I appreciate it. One of the things I'd just like to touch on on this slide is that fire, it, while it is a force of nature, it does have elemental parts. And it's important to understand how of those elements come together to create fire and then to create destructive fire, which, which are not one in the same. And we have to recognize and accept that fire is a natural and recurring feature of our landscape. And the exclusion of fire from our landscape is part of how we got to the problem we have today. And exclusion of fire from the landscape leads to a landscape that is out of equilibrium until it violently snaps back. And it is those violent corrections, the, the violent return to the mean is where we see loss of life, loss of property, an uncontrolled wildfire with all the negative outcomes associated with that. So if we accept that fire is going to occur and should occur on our landscape, the question then is how can we modify fire? How can we learn to adapt both the fire and our communities so that fire is now beneficial and return to an equilibrium? And to do that, it's, it's helpful to break the fire behavior down into the component parts. And those are the weather, which we cannot control. And in fact, in many ways is getting worse. Topography, which once again is unchangeable, but it is knowable. So we can plan for the effects of topography on fire. And lastly, fuel, both vegetative fuel and then um, structural fuel, man-built fuel. All of the things that fire requires to spread because without fuel, without that receptive substrate, fire cannot spread. With some very strict limitations, fire cannot spread across open spaces. It can't spread across either non-combustive or non-available fuel beds. And as we modify fuel, to include vegetations, structures, and other things that will burn that are in or around both the values at risk or create pathways into areas that we have concerns about fire spreading. As we modify those fuels, we can alter and modify the manner in which fire will spread. And it's important to recognize that we can either remove fuel, and, and the old version of this was the Southern California fire break where bulldozers ran along ridgelines uh, back when, thank you, so, thank you, Donnie. We can, we can remove fuel or we can modify it where we, we cut it, we break up the continuity by limbing of trees, the clearing of uh, heavy concentrations of brush or, or the removal of ladder fuels, or we can make it unavailable specifically uh, either by wetting in the case of vegetation or by hardening in the case of structures where there's still a tremendous fuel load in the structure, but it's now encased in a, a non-combustible exterior that makes it unavailable to burn. And for 110 years, as Donnie alluded to, we aggressively removed fire from the landscape. We had things such as the 10 a.m. rule, where the Forest Service sought to have every fire out by 10 a.m. the following morning. We had the removal of um, both native and indigenous burning, and then nascent prescribed fire activities on national parks and national forests in the 70s. All of those were removed, and they remain tremendously challenging to implement now uh, because of various single scope concerns and, and stakeholders who are concerned about an element, such as the parts per million in the air quality or the potential that a fire could get away. We're also inhibited by a incentive structure whereby the, the public officials and government officials who are responsible for managing these landscapes and for protecting structures, there are no incentives built into them to take any risk when it comes to allowing a beneficial to fire to burn. So our incentive structure for the public sector is aligned around putting fires out and putting it out quickly, because that's very explainable. And at the same time as we have done all of these things to allow fuels to accumulate in the natural landscape that is now out of equilibrium, up to 1.3 million structures and growing have been built in the wildland urban interface, creating an imperative to put out those fires that historically would have been allowed to burn, either because they're in areas that were inaccessible or of low value, or because there were not enough resources there to suppress those fires. And in California specifically and other parts of the West, climate change among other things has compressed the rainy season. So we are now exposed to more of those fall wind events because the, the window during which the fuels are available to burn has expanded. When, when there is a, a Diablo wind, a Santa Ana wind, a Chinook wind, uh, a dry wind out of the Northeast in the winter after the annual rains have begun, we have little or no risk of fire. But when those winds occur, and the landscape has not seen rain for six or nine months or more, we set the stage for conflagrations and wildfire that, that spreads in an uncontrolled manner. And an, an additive element to that is the manner in which drought has stressed vegetation, making where a, a healthy forest is generally very fire resistant, a drought stressed and diseased forest 
sets the stage for, for violent fire spread with high fire line intensities, extended flame lengths that simply exceed the design limitations of the, the fuel brakes and the other modifications that we have put in place to try to control fire. Next slide, please, Donna. Unfortunately, just as, as fire behavior and fire science is well understood, it is also well understood what we can do to mitigate the, the risk of those fires spreading into our communities and causing the loss of property and life. And if we look at a parcel level mitigation, we can do really two groups of things. We can modify fuel to create defensible space or the home ignition zone, starting with zone zero from zero to five feet, zone one from five to 30 feet, and then zone two from 30 to 100 feet. And we can modify the vegetation in that area so that fire, high intensity fire doesn't have a pathway to burn up to the home. So, so we take it starting at about 100 feet by modifying the fuel, reducing the, the fuel loads and reducing the compactness of the fuels and the continuous nature of the fuel beds. We can, we can modify from high intensity fire to low intensity patchy fire. And as we move closer to the home and we get down to zone zero in the last five feet where there is little or nothing that will burn, we can essentially eliminate the ground component of fire so that the, the home is only exposed to windblown embers, at which point home hardening kicks in where low cost, well understood and readily available modifications such as ember resistant screens, removing the last five feet of combustible fencing, removing any combustible siding within six inches of the ground. The, these very well understood and easy to implement mitigations can be applied so a home is now able to withstand windblown embers and through the fuel mitigation to create that defensible space, the home is unlikely to be exposed to direct flame impingement. And in doing that at the parcel level, we can dramatically reduce the risk of that parcel being exposed to high intensity fire, unless that parcel is small enough and the lot lines are close enough with minimal setbacks to the structures that the homeowner does not have the ability to mitigate out to 100 feet. Because while fuel mitigation to create defensible space is state law and adopted in local jurisdictions and LRA in many areas, it is simply not possible to require a homeowner to carry, carry out mitigations on someone else's property. And so the setbacks then start to become a critical element. And when the structure separation distances are less than 30 feet, or some, some would say less than 50 feet, the potential for a parcel igniting now so essentially puts at risk all of the parcels around it. And so it becomes very important to look at mitigations, not at a parcel level, but as a community level. And understanding that if that community has external fuel breaks, that will reduce the potential for fire to flow into the community, breaking up the fire pathways, if you will, by creating these varied fuel mosaics that mimic the natural landscape so that fire has to pick its way through a labyrinth of inhospitable settings clearing out vegetation on the roadside so that we have both the benefit of an evacuation route that has been proofed and maintained and will survive during fire, but we also benefit from the fire break element of, the, uh, of a roadway that will not burn. And by creating internal green belts, um, parks, um, golf courses, lakes, other things where community has cleared out areas that will not burn and adopting and enforcing the defensible space and home hardening standards we now start to set the stage to view a community as not subject just to landscape level risk coming off of a, a fixed and unchangeable wilderness area surrounding it as identified as state level maps. We now start to set the stage to value a community's risk and to assess it based on the conditions of the parcels that make it up. So rather than viewing the community as sitting on an unchanging landscape, which with great fire risk about which nothing can be done, Instead, we can view that community's risk as a landscape made up of parcels. And in doing that, we can give the community and the residents in that community, we can give them agency by giving them the method to increase, the, improve their own condition. If I do these things, my house is less likely to burn and my neighbor's houses are less likely to burn. And if they do those things, my house is less likely to burn as are theirs. And when expanded and somewhere between 10 and 100 homes in a, in a single block, we start to form internal fuel breaks by the work that is done to create defensible space and home hardening. And the great challenge in this is that while we understand what needs to be done, we don't have a mechanism for this to be reported. And we have failed, I believe, to communicate to, to the stakeholders at the community level, the residents, 
the way that their fates are intertwined and the need for them to carry out these mitigations in order to protect their home, their family, their parcel, but also to affect and to protect their neighbors' parcels and homes and families. And the manner in which a single home doing work, depending on the parcel size, may do very little to reduce the risk. But 100 homes doing the work in a continuous block, the, the sum will be far greater than the parts. And there's, I think there's an opportunity to unlock uh, a, a grassroots effort. Uh, we simply cannot enforce our way to solutions here. And as we're able to align this community empowerment with access to insurance and crediting from insurance, the insurance industry for the work that has been done, uh, I think we start to see real opportunities to improve things and very quickly, which is next slide, please, which is a lead in to a discussion of the uh, the current environment for regulations and enforcement. And just a brief primer on this, because it, uh, for those who know, this should be a review. For those who don't, that this stuff is tremendously opaque and complex. But in the state response areas, areas outside the established municipal boundaries of um, cities and towns, the state establishes minimum fire safety standards. Those also, as of late, now apply in local response areas or inside municipal boundaries if they are in a very high fire hazard severity zone. On top of that, Local government, through their adoption and amendment of the state fire code and their adoption of local ordinances and regulations, can meet or exceed the state minimums to establish more restrictive member measures based on the um, a finding of a substantial finding of a fact documenting the local fire risk. And what that results in is this patchwork of standards, so that there are, depending on the municipality or the jurisdiction in which you live. The requirements for your home, both for defensible space and for home hardening, will vary wildly, as well as it, there, is no, there is no standard for how much enforcement activity has to occur. And so depending on where you live, you may have a certain standard apply, and you may have little or no enforcement activity, or you may have a great deal of enforcement activity, and it varies wildly as you cross between jurisdictions all of which creates uncertainty and confusion, specifically when it comes to, to trying to communicate with industry to show what work has been done. And so there are communities that are doing a great deal yet are unable to get credit for that work. There are communities that are doing very little work and, and are not seeing the negative uh, impact as far as the, the pricing of risk. And so as a result of that, good, good behavior and good work is not rewarded and bad behavior or lack of work is not penalized and we sort of muddle along through the middle. And it's also worth noting that there is no state minimum standard for undeveloped lands, and there is no state standard for defensible space around government-owned structures. So our, our patchwork mosaic is further complicated by in areas where the state minimums apply, and there has not been local action to adopt more restrictive things, there is quite simply nothing that can be required as far as fuel mitigation and fire safety activity on undeveloped lands, and then government structures are, are simply exempt uh, under, under some uh, poorly thought out idea that, that fire doesn't burn the same way depending on the ownership of the structure. And amidst all of this, as, we, as I mentioned earlier with the lack of incentive structure uh, for those in government to, to move forward on things, we have a, a host of single scope advocates either um, in interest groups or in government agencies who are tasked with, with overseeing a single thing. Air quality happens to be one of them that impacts our ability to expand prescribed fire activities. And those single scope advocates, they, they have a veto. And so as you try to navigate the path to establishing a comprehensive community wildfire safety plan to include a prescribed fire element or a fuel mitigation element or a distribution of public funds to, as incentives, all, you're running an essential gauntlet uh, of, of things, all of whom have, and, and entities, all of whom have veto authority over your ability to move forward. And what all of this comes together when, when the average resident approaches the problem of fire safety and what can I do, is there is ambiguity and there's uncertainty. And that ambiguity and uncertainty, unless it clear, it's spoken to with a clear voice and a compelling case, it reinforces the status quo bias. A line I've heard on a number of occasions in the fire district here is that I have lived here since 1970 and I have never had to do this before. And as you stand there with the resident and you look out over the overgrown parcel, the only thing you can say is I believe you on both counts. Because what we have done before is no longer going to be enough, but we are fighting the powerful influence of I have, I have always done it this way. This is different. This is going to take effort and this is going to take money. 
And if there is uncertainty, I'm not going to pull the trigger on executing these actions until I know for sure that one, I have to, and two, it's going to have a beneficial outcome. And I believe that the next frontier and the opportunity to advance the, our, our quest towards a fire safe and resilient state and communities is by aligning the economic incentives, non-moral economic incentives. We cannot um, finger wag and scold and we cannot enforce our way out of this. We, we need to identify opportunities to bring basic economic principles in alignment with the desired outcome to preserve our communities and build resiliency uh, in order to generate bottom-up grassroots parcel by parcel interest in adopting these well understood defensible space and home hardening measures. Uh, with that, I, I think it's a good opportunity to hand it over to Dr. Taylor for a discussion of basic economics. Sir. Okay, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to participate. I've learned so much already. So it's a tremendous amount of benefit. And I like this title, by the way, California, well, let's not forget California wildfires crisis to opportunity. We're going to figure a way to deal with this tremendous problem. And that's that's the purpose of this. So I'm going to start with this rational choice theory, which is how economists view a lot of these things in a really basic way. I mean, really the most elementary way is we assume there's consumers, there are consumers, and they maximize their utility. Uh, they have a budget constraint. They can only spend a certain amount. So they they do that, that's a good behavioral description, which seems to work pretty well. And we have firms uh, in the society, uh, their objective is to maximize profits for the most part. And they have a reality of production function. They have to have some inputs to have outputs. And so they deal with that, that links the outputs and the inputs together. And then for the most part, we take the prices of given. That sounds a little strange since prices are set by firms and others, but uh, if it's a competitive market, you really can't go too much away from the, the basic uh, price. So, uh, and the market may generally be determining those prices, uh, but they're not variable and the firms can't affect them very much in the most basic model. So in this situation, it's, it's called perfect competition. Um, and we have uh, a basic principle of economics uh, that in this situation, it's fully efficient. You can't do better. You're, you're not having a lot of the things that Dave and Donnie have already mentioned. So you have a efficient system. You really can't do better than this. It, economists say there's no dead weight loss. It's really the best you can do. And it, that's the circumstance. It's again, firms uh, maximizing profits consumers maximizing utility, they take the prices as given, which is, which is pretty much a competitive market. And then it's fully efficient. You, you can't do better than that, even if you had all the information. Now, the question is for today, does this apply to, to fire mitigation? And the simple answer is yes, if all those conditions hold, but I'm gonna argue in a minute, they don't hold. There's not this, uh, independence uh, completely. There's a great deal of, of spillover and externality. You've heard a lot about that uh, already. So this idea that there's a externality, that uh, pollution is an externality, fire is an externality. There's an effect of what one person does on another that can't be captured in the market. So these externalities or spillovers, maybe a general term, cause a deviation from this basic principle, which is so beautiful that you can't do better. And, and if there are these externalities, uh, then you, you deviate it. And it, it creates a role for government to intervene in some way or, or, or form. And of course, we have a lot of that. The whole fire protection aspect is that. But just some, some statistics of, of in the United States, a lot of goods are produced by government. I have some statistics here, 50% of the employment as a percentage of total government employment is education, 50%. Police, 5%. The judicial and legal aspect of courts, 2%. Fire protection seems, it seems low, but it's 2%, 2% of the total. Maybe we could do better than that. But that's, that's the numbers that you get from uh, the data. But those are all in a sense of uh, produced by public goods, education for the most part is a public good and, and fire protection is as well. So the question really is we, as we analyze this and, and we think about rational choice and I'll 
I'll go into this economic man versus real man a little bit, whether there needs to be extra efforts in a fire protection area. And the, the basic idea is that people, they just may not take into account the risk that they are causing others by ignoring the risks in general. That's an externality. If I build a house and I don't care about fire risk, I'm making it more dangerous, more risky for the people next door. That's an externality that doesn't naturally cause, naturally affected by the market. So we have to think about a way to do that. Now this term economic man, as distinct from so-called real man, it connotes the idea, just what I've said, uh, economic man maximizes utility. Uh, it sounds a little abstract, but again, in the good circumstances, it works well. And of course, some have criticized this notion a lot, maybe too much. And I think to some extent, this uh, it seems to most things you think about in the world, real world may violate this rational choice theory. And you just think about examples yourself. Individuals do seem to place higher importance on avoiding loss or making gain. They don't want to lose anything. So they take actions different from just maximizing their profits. So that's the idea. There are, there are economic uh, so-called uh, people and they are defined by those who, who maximize utility. And there are real people. Now, the, there are defenders and maybe I'm, in that school who thinks that the economic model is pretty good and we need to think to modify it. And I think as a, a defender, I would say that it's very common to argue that people in the real world don't have all this information. They don't have access to you, your simple models, assume. And that's true. But what we argue in economics, uh, and this applies very much to the subject, is that you can modify the models to depict more real life decisions and with the, with the bounds on the adjustment. In fact, you can adjust your utility function that you're maximized. Remember consumers maximize utility. You can adjust that to account for externalities. You can include someone else's property in your utility function. You can principally, you can do that. In which case, if you ignore it, you're not uh, doing the right thing. So the question is, how do you modify um, the basic model, which works very well in many cases, not in all. How do you modify it? And that's really comes to the third question. It, there's people have argued that there should be a so-called choice architecture. Um, and with the choice architecture affects how the decision is made. And it's, it's most useful in situations like we're discussing today, the, the upfront costs uh, seem high to have these uh, mitigations. And people ignore the long-term benefits, which, which both Dave and Donnie have indicated quite a bit. There are long-term benefits from this. So the idea of, of choice architecture and uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein have, have made a, a big deal of this in their book, it's simply called Nudge, N-U-D-G-E, that, that you can adjust how people make their decisions in small ways, um, but have large effects uh, without underlying the notion that they're still making these decisions, they're maximizing utility or maximizing profits to the best they can. And they've, they've promoted this concept of, of choice, choice architecture is what it's called, as a means to, to make decision-making more attuned to the objectives that we have to, to limit the fires, for example. And you know, one example of this is we just adjust the decision somewhat. One, one thing that seems a little abstract, but an example of, of, of a nudge thinking or uh, this idea of choice architecture is to be clear about what the defaults are. So the type of nudge that seems to be successful, type of choice architecture that seems to be successful is it prevents people from sticking to the same choice year after year. That's in some sense the problem we have People don't want to seem to adjust it just fine. I've been doing this 75 years, as Dave said. So how do you make the adjustment? And one way is you say, well, you nudge people in a direction. If they make this choice time after time after time, it's going to be beneficial. So one example of that, people may be reluctant to save. What's the big of saving? But if the choice is not just saving one year, but saving year after year after year, then there's more likely to go in that direction. So you change the choice set a little bit. This is not a big change. It's year after year rather than one year. Then you'll move in the direction 
that is more um, more suitable. In other words, more more rational, more in the direction of what you'd like to have happen. So that's the basic idea of uh, choice architecture. Now, I don't think that's the only way to go about this. In fact, in some sense, of behind the scenes uh, that um, have has already been emphasized is, is that there are other ways to deal with this. Now, clearly, in the case of fire, there's a tremendous externality, uh, which has really been the benefit with what, uh, what has been discussed so far. If I don't take care of the of my house and it's, it's prevention from fire, then it makes much more higher the risk of neighboring facilities. Wildfires can easily spread across properties. So the fire risk at one property increases significantly if the fire risk of nearby properties increase. And this, this is something that has to be faced. Maybe it affects how the, how the prices are determined. Maybe it affects taxes. And it maybe affects the way we uh, distribute our public goods. But this, this last point on the thing is, what is the appropriate weight on prices and incentives and we have to, that's how we deal with externalities more generally. If then there, the fire is just one of many to be sure. Um, we have a, why do we have a military? Why is the military is a public good? Because it benefits all of us. And so it's the same idea. So now I think what's promising, and this is hinted at a little bit in the, in the material uh, that I think is available, it's very hard to get estimates of this in the case of fire. We don't know exactly when you made it up. People say it wasn't like this 25 years ago, 75, but look at the data and, and you can build this into models. It's hard to get estimates of the effect, but there are these new kind of models and that's how economists try to get a, a handle on this, how to get a handle on the externalities. But there's new kinds of models. Uh, they're sometimes called catastrophic simulation models, wildfire catastrophic simulation models. And they can help because they give you, it's like you simulate what will happen if one area doesn't take care of its property, doesn't do the right fire mitigation, the thing that was indicated in some of the diagrams you already saw. And so that enables us to get the incentives right. The models, um, it's not the only way to do it, but it's a good way to do it, can be employed to get estimates of how much do you compensate a homeowner for mitigation efforts? Maybe if I take extra care of my property, the kind of things that Dave was referring to, I should be rewarded in some way. And that's really how you remedy the externality. That is, that is giving me some reward for taking actions, benefits the whole neighborhood, not just myself. And, and so that's one thing you get an estimate because we don't know how, how much should be. What should be the appropriate weight? on prices and incentives. Well, prices do affect how much uh, incentives you have. And so another thing is the, there's understory uh, problems that are all over the place. It's costly to reduce those. It's not, and it's, I don't, who, who, do, who do we charge? In some sense, maybe it's the best is to charge the, the areas nearby uh, rather than to be more general about that. And so I think all these things, whether it's the, how do you compensate homeowners, how do you deal with the understory? How do you quantify the costs and the benefits from these important actions, which we know you take into account? So it seems to me that we have a way to do this. It's not so much based on choice architecture. It's based on the basic uh, idea of externalities, which we have dealt with in many ways over time. They're tough, they're difficult, they're harder to estimate. It's not easy to do, but there, there's an indication you can do it. And that's what I think um, this whole session is about. How do we get some estimates and how do we charge people? It has to be charged for this extra externality that they're causing. So I'll stop there, so thank you very much. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. I think from there, we're going to roll over to, to Mike to now kind of bring it together to, from the fire science to the economic incentives perspective, and then talk a little bit, how do we take public policy and use that to kind of pull those things together to have some positive change in the space. Thanks for having me. And it's a real honor to be on this webinar with all of you. I have a tremendous respect um, for pretty much everyone in this webinar, and it's pretty exciting to be in this, um, this group of speakers. Um, 
I want to back up for a second to some of the comments that were made um, at the beginning of the webinar and just reflect a little bit. Um, I think it's clear that um, as we look at this problem, one of the challenges that's making it difficult to manage is the rapidity with which the risk has changed. And we have a, a set of very stable, sort of uh, very durable institutions for allocating risks associated with property in the United States and in common law systems. Um, and those risks, th that approach has worked pretty well. The approach involving um, allocation of liability for um, fires, which is really focused on ignition as the kind of key um, action to which liability attaches, right? Did you light the fire or not? Um, not did your failure to manage fuels allow fire to be transmitted across your property onto another? Um, it has also um, you know, focused on insurance markets where the insurers are pretty heavily regulated at the state level in terms of the prices they can charge. And that's led to, you know, if you can't charge the right price, then you have to take action in terms of the supply you provide to the market of insurance products. And I think that goes a long way to explaining a lot of the behavior that was described very accurately in the, um, the insurance discussion earlier. And, and we have, you know, a situation culturally with respect Effect to fire that is really, as, as was discussed, I thought really nicely focused on fire suppression rather than fire management um, and, and a lack of recognition that, especially in California, especially in the Western United States, because of the arid Mediterranean climate, we live in a place where the ecology was has evolved to burn and that there used to be people in the landscape that burned it very intentionally and actively. And we're really a part of that landscape and a part of that ecology. And in California, at least we, you know, Americans showed up in 1849 and rapidly removed those people from the landscape that they had inhabited for millennia and with which they had a stable relationship. And, and, and in many ways, you know, a, a context in which they had created the landscape that we found using tools like fire. So run the clock forward 100 years, add 40, or I guess maybe 39 million people to the 1 million that were here when um, the gold rush occurred. And, we, and, and then throw on top of that, you know, the, the effects of, of climate change and the kind of intensified impact of climate change on fire risk, because as temperatures rise, the atmosphere in the West and over California has gotten a lot thirstier. And you end up in this situation where we have a really rapid change, probably since about 2015, in the risk of wildfire. And so everyone is scrambling to catch up. Institutions change slowly. Policies change slowly. They, they tend to lag the facts. And that's part of what's going on in a crisis right now. But I also think that there is a real need to think about um, the balance of spending on fire prevention versus fire suppression. In California today, we spend in a good year, actually last year was a record, we spent 1.5 billion on fire prevention. Um, but that compares to a more normal year when we spend about $200 million. Um, and fire suppression costs in California, if you include state and federal expenditures, have been well over 5 billion for at least the last several years, and they are not going down. I, think there, I don't think there's any question. Um, Cal Fire in particular has asked for a significant increase in spending. The Forest Service is gonna need to increase their spending because they cannot attract sufficient firefighters at the salaries and benefits that they're currently offering. They're at 50% of staffing levels in some forests right now heading into our fire season because the salary is too low. And if we wanna have firefighters, we need to pay them a wage that actually attracts them to the job. And the job is getting harder, obviously, because of the fire conditions. So a big piece of the challenge then is what is the right balance economically between spending on fire prevention or, or you know, efforts at fire management of the, of the type that, that uh, Dave discussed in some detail, right? How much should we be spending on landscape scale fuel treatment to reduce the fire intensity in the wildlands? 
How much should we be spending on community protection? How much should we be spending on hardening of structures? Also, who is the appropriate person to spend it, right? Who has the greatest ability to manage the problem when the problem is hardening a home or preparing a community or managing a large um, landscape like the mountains, the Santa Cruz Mountains, where there are many you know, jurisdictions that own undeveloped land? Um, these are incredibly difficult problems. I think the, the, the short answer is we need to be spending a lot more money on prevention rather than fire suppression, because fire suppression, especially during the times when we most need it, is getting less and less effective, unfortunately, because the fire intensities have increased to the point where when, when, when fire is most destructive, it is also least susceptible to the efforts of our firefighters. And they really shift to a life safety mode where they are trying to move people out of the way rather than stand in defense structures. So we need to create an environment by spending money and by changing institutions where there's more prevention to, to create an opportunity for our firefighters to do their work in communities. We saw this actually really effectively demonstrated a, this di a different balance of prevention versus fire suppression spending in the Caldor fire last year, a fire that burned in Lake Tahoe. It burned right up to the Tahoe Basin at high intensity, came over Echo Summit, and um, was sh showering embers down into the communities of South Lake Tahoe, firefighters were able to stand and defend those communities. The reason wasn't that the fire intensity was low. It was that uh, it was that investments by the communities over the span of more than 15 years had been made to reduce fuels in the communities and around the communities. And that led to exactly the kinds of effects that Dave described and that, that, that meant that essentially no structures were lost in South Lake Tahoe, even as this fire that had roared up the 50 corridor um, you know, came over the summit. And, and anyone who's driven down 50 from Echo Summit knows you know, it's a, it's a straight vertical drop onto these homes. So, so there's no question that if there hadn't been fuel modification and that investment in prevention, we would have seen large scale structure loss. Um, another complicating factor, and, and this can't be ignored in California, but it's, it's an even bigger problem in other parts of the West, is who owns the land. California, in California, about 40% of the forests, a lot of the red on that map where there's very high risk is owned by the federal government. So California doesn't necessarily have um, the right to take action on those lands to reduce risk. And there are legal decisions that were, um, that were cases that were brought in the early 2000s that say that the federal government doesn't have any liability or responsibility when they fail to manage that kind of the, the landscape in a way that would create safety for neighboring communities. So again, there's this question of how is the risk being allocated? Is it being allocated, the, li the potential liability to the parties that have the best opportunity to manage it efficiently? And I think the answer right now is no. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if it was easy to sort of pay people and trade, you know, pay, pay, pay the federal government to do the job, but in practice, it's not. Um, and and there, there are lots of reasons for that, but. But the reality on the ground is that it's, it's very difficult to, to make those kinds of exchanges via contract where I pay my neighbor if the neighbor is the federal government or say a state park or another kind of landowner to reduce risk so that I benefit. It does happen, it can happen, but it takes enormous effort to overcome those barriers to trade. Um, the, the situation, however, I would say is improving, and I want to emphasize that. I'm at least like modestly optimistic about this problem in terms of how we're making progress, particularly in California, where there's so much um, real estate value at risk. Um, we are seeing local initiatives um, to really push fuel breaks. We're seeing significant increases in state funding to fund the creation of community-level fire protection. We're seeing... Uh, a tiptoeing into the space of home hardening, where there are a few pilot projects that are being implemented by CAL FIRE. Um, and we've, of course, seen a dramatic expansion in fire, um, uh, well, I say fire suppression capacity. Um, a key challenge right now, though, is, is how to sustain those efforts and how to create private business opportunities rather than a grant funded kind of government led effort but how to create incentives for local property, you know, local property owners, 
neighbors, working with neighbors to create um, to create fire safe environments where that are fire tolerant, where where low intent, where it is safe for low intensity fire to occur, and where firefighters stand a good chance of keeping that fire away from homes. And I, I, I do think that that the the long term trajectory needs to be a real a real rethinking of our our obligations um, if we own wildlands. Um, you know, it was mentioned earlier that there's no, no rules about what is responsible maintenance of wild wildlands. And, and as a result, people are irresponsible with respect to fire. And as um, Professor Taylor mentioned, they, they maximize their, their um, utility. If that's a logging company, it means you thin and then you just leave slash on the ground, slash that dries out and becomes extremely dangerous when a fire enters a forest. Um, if, it's a, if it's a person who's living in a relatively dense neighborhood, maybe they plant cypress trees on their lot line or bamboo on their lot line. I actually have a neighbor across my fence is a wall of bamboo. It creates lots of privacy for my neighbor. It is 16 feet from my structure, right? Not 100 feet, not 50 feet, 16 feet. And, you know, those kinds of actions are people, people take because they create benefits for the person, whether it's improved returns on a parcel held for logging or privacy for a home that's in a very dense neighborhood, but they create externalities and, and future losses, or at least expected losses for everyone around them. And so we need to, we need to strive through law and policy to try to internalize some of these risks that are being externalized, or we need to find out ways to reduce the barriers to trade, right? So that I'm more able to say to my neighbor, hey, let me pay you. Um, or we, a community that lives adjacent to a forest, a national forest, is able to ask the national forest, you know, to pay the national forest, say, to to apply prescribed fire within a mile or two of the community so that there is a fuel mosaic that's created. And, and I love the metaphor that um, Chief Winokur used of a, of a labyrinth for the fire to pass through. We, we wanna increase the complexity of that labyrinth in any way we can. And right now the challenge is the liabilities typically aren't held by the people that are best able to manage them. And, the, um, and there are enormous barriers to trading those liabilities. So insurance, historically has played an incredibly important role in fixing some of these problems, right? And, and they, it played it first in the 1800s in urban environments in the United States. Insurers showed up and started mapping and mapping risk to structures. And then they forced changes in building codes. And that, that has made our cities much less subject to ignition than other places. And I think you know what we're starting to see with the catastrophe modeling that's really advancing and, and becoming much more sophisticated, able to, to evaluate the, the risk reduction and the risk spend efficiency of particular interventions in the landscape. What we're seeing is a move outside of the city into the wildland urban, urban interface um, of this kind of insurance-led approach. The challenge is gonna be that right now, we still don't charge enough for insurance. In, in, in California, you know, the, the reality is that the, the, you know, the fair plan levels have stabilized higher than they, much higher than they were prior to the 17 and 18 fire seasons, but they're more or less stable because the, the California Department of Insurance has allowed rates to go up modestly, but we're still in a fragile situation where we're probably underpricing risk and we could have a, a major loss event like um, the, the, the tragedy that occurred in Paradise or the one that occurred in Santa Rosa um, before it. And, and that could destabilize our home, home insurance market with really debilitating consequences to the broader California economy because you can't sell houses if you can't get, it, it's, it's much more difficult to sell houses if you can't get um, admitted lines coverage. And, and that, you know, the real, real estate is for better or worse, you know, the, 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 the place where wealth is stored and, and probably created by, for many people in California. Um, so I think there's a lot of risk, but I also think that um, we're, we're, we're making progress. Part of the progress um, is, is really via um, insurance markets. Part of the progress is via um, greater enforcement and a willingness to enforce um, codes um, on the part of fire departments and greater funding 
to actually have people available to enforce defensible space code. Um, the but I think I think the the in conclusion I just say that that you know we've made progress, but we have a long way to go even to catch up with where the risk is now. And unfortunately, because of climate change, the risk is not going to stay where it is now. And you know, I was I was just on a on a retreat related to wildfire um, at a place located above the site of the Nuns and Tubbs fires in in Santa in the mountains above Santa Rosa, and you know you look around that place and the every home is new because all of them were burned down in 2017. They are they're all modern farmhouses, um, and the and you know the, you, it's it's hard not to look around that place. And think of all the other places in California where it could happen, and also not to think that it could happen there again as well. Um, until we can make the changes that that create economic incentives, either via insurance markets or via liability or both, I think we're gonna we're gonna underperform in terms of risk prevention because people are busy, they're struggling to afford a California lifestyle as it is. Shelter in California is enormously challenging economically, and and, and without these kind of more fundamental changes to the, the bedrock economics of, of real estate, it's hard to see us making the progress we need to. But I think that, that over the last five years, we've made some progress. And I'm optimistic that we will continue to make it and, and eventually, you know, within the next perhaps decade, get closer to where we need to be. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mike. I think uh, that was a great run through uh, of the problem across uh, across the panel. Um, it is uh, two fifty eight. Uh, my time. We'll take about a ten minute break, uh, maybe seven minutes or so. We'll come back at uh, three oh five. So give everyone a chance to take a quick break here, and then uh, we'll get back up and, and start the conversation amongst our panel. So uh, with that, uh, everyone take a quick break, and we'll see you in about uh, seven minutes. Okay, it's uh, five minutes after the hour. We'll go ahead and. Um, pick back up with the uh, the panel discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, lead a few of these questions out um, where, to start the conversation. And I, Dave and I have been trying to answer uh, the questions that have been coming in throughout the uh, the presentation as they come up. We'll try to take some of these elements to your questions and integrate it into the discussion and uh, potentially pull some of these questions out to ask. So continue to, uh, to ask away. We'll try to answer uh, asynchronously as we go through this and we'll try to integrate in the discussion. Um, so bear with us as we, as we move forward with it. But um, Maybe to start out, um, I'd like to welcome everyone back and maybe get, get started with Dave. Um, when we bring all this together, one of the key things we've seen is, is the mitigation and home hardening elements are probably the key aspect. If we got collective communities in California to do this, we would have a profound impact on the fire. So we know, based off the fire behavior triangle, how targeting that fuel slows the spread, but it seems like there's some differing elements of what is the right standards for mitigation and home hardening. So we'd like to hear a little bit about how do those work? What is the right standard of mitigations that actually matter? And then are there any resource challenges or other things uh, that impact uh, a, consumer, a homeowner's ability to actually execute those? So uh, Dave? Sure, thank you. So there, there a lot of good work has been done uh, by a lot of folks, specifically IBHS and NIST with their wildfire prepared home and the um, California Department of Insurance with their um, prepare safer from wildfire framework. Uh, there's a lot of alignment around those. There are a core set of mitigations that matter that have been identified to build upon our existing understanding of defensible space, the developing understanding of the importance of zone zero, that zero to five feet that the Board of Forestry is currently finalizing the regulations to define what those steps are. And then the recent work uh, included among other things in, in this technical note 2205, that identify the elements of home hardening, uh, which are currently required for new construction. However, the vast majority of the housing stock in these fire prone areas is existing non-conforming. It would not be allowed to be built today. Uh, however, prior to 2007, that ember resistant construction standard in California Building Code 7A or Residential Code 337 didn't exist. And so the, the thoughtful retrofits, specifically um, ember resistant vents, the lifting of combustible siding within six inches of ground, the replacement uh, of non-rated roofs, of which there are very few. And then um, uh, relatively new, at least from my perspective, is the requirement to replace combustible fencing within five feet of a structure. Is that a lot of new research has shown that a wooden combustible fence acts as a wick, uh, a pathway. It draws fire to the home and it has to be interrupted. However, if 
excluding the roof, which is um, a different topic, although 99% of California homes have class A roof coverings on them. But excluding the roof, these mitigations are not only well understood, but they're very inexpensive, particularly relative to the value of the home and of the community, of the aggregate. And so they're, to answer your question, yes, they are understood. Um, they, they have recently been formalized into a series of frameworks through IBHS and the California Department of Insurance, um, confirmed by NIST studies. Uh, there's more work, obviously, to be done, but, but I, I believe those mitigations that matter are well understood, um, are relatively inexpensive, and uh, are not particularly widespread and prevalent. And then the second part of once they're, they're well understood is giving homeowners and residents a mechanism to report the presence of those mitigations. And there are a lot of lessons learned from the hurricane hardening in, um, in Florida, where the widespread fraud has been noted by various observers of the insurance industry there. When residents self-report that they have done hurricane and high wind retrofits without confirmation required. And so that the, the problem of getting people to do the work is the first thing, and then giving a mechanism for them to report that they have done it is a second problem that, that does absolutely um, re require some work. Um, Mike, I'd like, to, I'd like to hand the floor to you because you, you do have thought a lot on this subject. You're on mute, sir. Mike, you're still on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. I completely agree with everything that Dave said about the the, the proof um, with, with respect to the effectiveness of many of these interventions, and especially of zone zero, of the non-combustible zone um, from zero to five feet. We need to come up with a better name for that than zone zero, but, but um, what I've personally experienced, and this is in, in a very affluent community in which I live in Northern California, is tremendous resistance to implementation of zone zero requirements. When my city council proposed a zone zero requirement, the fire chief's home burned down in the Tubbs fire because he couldn't afford to live in the community that he serves. And he proposed, you know, kind of leading on this uh, in uh, 2019 to, to implement a zone zero requirement. Nearly 1,200 people showed up at the city council meeting to oppose it uh, because they didn't want to rip out their shrubbery. They have aesthetic values that they, that they prefer to fire safety. And, and this gets at some of the issues that John Taylor was, you know, emphasizing that we need to figure out ways for people to internalize some of the incentives, um, because if they don't, you know, other 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 incentives that that allow them to maximize their utility will dominate, and will choose them to make societally suboptimal decisions. Mike, I think that's spot on. In the uh, California Legislative Analyst Office, which I think you quoted in your in your paper as well actually did, did a survey and they said like, why won't you do these things? And you hit one of the key things with the, as aesthetics. Some others are like, I don't want to do the cost. It's too much time and effort. I don't really understand why this is necessary. Well, I don't believe that it's necessary, but aesthetics always shows up in the top five because, hey, I love those those English boxwoods along my, along my house. Uh, but really what you've done is basically lined up like torches just waiting for the fire to come up. Um, maybe I can roll over to John on that because I think, Dave's outlined a compelling case for why mitigations matter. Uh, Mike's talked a little bit about that public policy. So can you maybe talk a little bit about some of those reasons why homeowners might not do those and what economic levers might be able to be used to kind of get them over that hump? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think one of the things we forget about externalities that are frequently resolved by the private parties getting together and saying, we'll do this if you do that. And it could be a, a noisy, uh, area with a hospital that people can't sleep and so they have a, an agreement with the community to be quiet in these times so people can sleep they work that out just fine so i think probably it seems a little abstract but maybe that's maybe more information could help on that so the people with the shrubbery can realize well a little smaller shrubs would work fine if if our neighbors do something or if the community is something it's it's i think maybe think a little bit more about the voluntary aspects here which are more uh, than we think now this these are new issues people are just learning about them um i learned about it today myself so i think i think maybe just focus on that a little bit uh, you know more than i do about the various things that can be done sort of on a on a private party basis. I mean, that's, I'm not saying they're all resolved that way, that's for sure, but maybe more than we think. Uh, that's a great point, John. And there was a question that was brought up by the audience too, speaking about that. Or, you know, and, and I'll ask Dave and Mike, if you've seen, are there been cases where you see like a community group together, like, hey, I'm not gonna go shell out 
1500 bucks to do my stuff just yet because everyone else around me has these big Italian cypresses that are going to burn down my house. But can we all agree that if we collectively do this, let's move together on it? Are there ways where we've seen communities pool resources to address that as a collective group? Like almost like once we've all agreed to it, once it goes up a certain amount, we're all going to agree to kind of start making those, making those moves. Absolutely. I think you see that most frequently with HOAs where they pass more restrictive landscaping, um, where historically it was to maintain a, a certain landscaping, I, the, the Sunset Magazine suburban ideal, and now it's being passed with fire safety in mind. And so you see small groups, self-organized, external from uh, any government regulation or mandate, deciding not only are we going to do this uh, as a matter of our CCNRs, but we are going to tax ourselves to fund it. And, and I think that offers, um, it is a great example of where those folks, um, in the case of a condo association, typically it's tied to the shared requirement for insurance because the building itself is commonly owned. And so everyone sees the impact of, of wildfire insurance. And, and because it's aggregated, the, the price is much higher because you, you have aggregated and concentrated um, value that must be insured. And so that spurs them to do the, to do the work. The, the economic elements are the same. It's just been concentrated to the point that it is harder to miss. And when your insurance premium goes from, in the case of a, a condo association in, in Tahoe, I recently became aware of, their, their annual insurance went from $120,000 premium for $50 million worth of coverage to a $1.2 million premium for $30 million worth of coverage. As one can imagine under those circumstances, they're now interested in any solution that's price tag is less than a million dollars because it is, it is a clear economic trade-off to them that they, they can invest their way to a fire, to a safer environment, which will be recognized in lower premiums. Now that's an extreme example, but the same principles apply to everyone else. And, and I, I could not agree more with what Mike said about the resistance. Uh, people are committed and have an emotional attachment to their landscaping. And it is going to take a powerful driver to shake that free. And, and in areas that have experienced wildfire recently, it is fresh in their minds, that, that sense of waking up in the night to see the glow in their, in their bathroom window and knowing it was time to go in, in, their, in their heart. Those folks are susceptible and open to the discussion of fire safety. But, but that is, a, as we mentioned in the opener, that is a very small subset of the population as a whole. And, and we simply are not going to make our way to an eventual solution after fire has burned and, and subjected everyone in the WUI to fire, right? We, we need to find a way to accelerate, to share that experience. And I, I believe the best surrogate to having seen the glow of fire through your window is having seen the potential significant increase in the cost of your insurance and understanding that these are the mitigations you can take to reduce your risk of wildfire with a beneficial outcome for your family and your home and reduce your risk of either non-renewal or significant increases in your premium. Yeah, maybe one way, Dave, is a better marketing thing to get Sunset Magazine to show this is how your landscape should really look in the future. And it, it isn't, a, there's nothing in the zero to five zone, right? That's probably a, a whole separate piece. Um, maybe I'll throw over to Mike because in, in, in the white paper you put out in, in April 2021, talked about a new strategy, you talked a little bit about this already, about how to integrate those uh, elements across different approaches. But I think that um, I'm kind of curious, what are some of the elements that make creation of those government structures capable of implementing these projects so difficult. And I think uh, one of the questions that came up too was a new CAL FIRE initiative and organization. And they were kind of curious, like, how does that, uh, how does that fit? And I'll scroll through and see if I can pull the name of it out, but I'll throw to you, Mike. Well, what I'd say is, you know, the, the effort we need to make to get, to get through the, the existing inventory of homes that are not built to the wildland inter urban interface code is enormous. I don't think we, you know, and, and the challenge we face with rely, I would argue we do need in new institutions, mostly because for the foreseeable future, our firefighters, especially our wildland firefighters, suburban wild firefighters, they are going to be working flat out. I mean, the, the demands that are being placed upon that workforce are really unprecedented. And it's hard for me to imagine expecting that workforce in their down season, when they really do need to be resting, they need to be taking vacation, which they're unable to take when they're out fighting campaign fires for, you know, several months at a time during the fire season. 
when their lungs need to rest because they've been exposed to very significant concentration smoke. It's hard for me to believe that we have adequate workforce in that existing space to get this job done um, and to do the kind of community building and, and kind of public relations work, frankly, that, that needs to happen to, to get the kind of soft intervention that, that, that um, Professor Taylor you know, mentioned as an idea. Where we've seen this kind of work done really successfully tends to be in affluent communities. Uh, so, you know, the example I used in my paper was Montecito, which is a very affluent community um, in the Santa Barbara area. And they did a tremendous job of uh, doing community level um, firework prior to the Thomas fire. And it meant that as the Thomas fire roared down out of the mountains, they lost, I think it was three structures. Um, because they were able, the firefighters were able to def defend the community um, using prepared zones that had been that had taken years of work to get done. But you know, Montecito is not a model for most places in California because most places in California don't have home values; they can't tax themselves in the way that Montecito did. And so, a big question I think is how we help all of California, or if we choose not to, you know, how we manage the ensuing you know, loss of community integrity that's gonna occur. Um, and, and I would prefer, you know, I think we're a rich enough economy that we can afford to hire people, you know, maybe fund them at the state level, but, but have them hired at the local level to do this kind of work and execute it at scale for most, if not all smaller communities that are in high risk areas. Probably though, that also has to be paired with some limitations on where people build in the future. Because you know the other thing is that a lot of these communities exist because local government planning incentives also don't price this risk. You know, if you're in the state responsibility area, you're not really paying for the risk you take in terms of the cost of fire suppression. The state is paying for it. And, and, and maybe even the federal government, if it's a federal disaster declaration. And so we need to, you know, we need to figure out ways if we're going to fund this effort at mitigation to also try to constrain how much mitigation effort we need to do, try not to make the problem worse um, as we're trying to solve. And, and I think those problems are paired, but 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 this is also true at the individual level. Once you get out of homeowners associations, you know. My neighbors, two of my neighbors are retired um, um, Vietnam era veterans, both of them on disability, and their homes are like tiki torches in, in my neighborhood, and they have no capital, they do not have liquidity that would allow them to, to, to make investments in home hardening that would increase the safety of all. Um, and so we need to figure out how to solve for that problem as well. And yeah, Mike, I think that's a great point. And there's a current, um, for those who don't know, there's a current California wildfire mitigation program that's been launched experimental, I think it's in San Diego, Shasta and Lake counties that tries to ju address just that because it recognizes some people don't have the resources or wherewithal to do that, even if they do uh, care about that. And right now it's looking at five vulnerability factors, some of which you mentioned, age, poverty, disability, language, transportation, and trying to highlight the ones, at least in those counties where we can, California will send home assessment teams and budget for that to go in, assess and do those mitigations. So I think we are seeing that. It's, it's interesting to see how that experimental program works in those counties and whether or not there's either funding to really expand, expand it across California. Uh, but you make a great point. Like, and I think this also ties together to what, what John uh, and some of our uh, attendees mentioned is like, this is a great example where a community could come together and say, okay, I can protect my home, but the three or four of us can come together and go help clear some brush on, the, on, on our neighbor's property that we know can't do that themselves to try to work that out. And I think there's certainly some goodness to come out of a community approach to this instead of what it is now, like I'm going to hide my own my own domicile and and hope that I've got insurance that will cover it. And um, we're even seeing this now in, in some of the questions, of, some of the research that we've done, but also questions from the panel of saying, hey, my insurer's pulling out or my neighbor just bought his house and can get insurance. What are my options? And I think that um, maybe I can kind of just reach back out to Dave on that because I think there's a piece of this, right, where we have the right mitigation, we have the right ideas, but do insurance companies actually recognize that? And a related piece for the fire service that, that Mike touched on is, you know, government does some things really well. Fire suppression is one thing they, they do do well, but going out and doing fire mitigation is probably not the best use of firefighters time to your point. And if you don't do it pre-fire, what you end up having is now fires coming in and firefighters, instead of suppressing that fire, 
are actually doing that mitigation under duress to prevent that fire from hitting and increasing the destruction. So, so maybe Dave, I'll, I'll throw you just throw it to you just to comment on the, on the, those issues. Absolutely. I, I think there are times and places such as, and we, I look forward to seeing the results from the pilot program where, where some external funding or resources um, that are helpful to get folks to uh, adopt the, the mitigations that matter. Um, to, to Mike's point about both um, his community or Montecito, uh, resources are not generally the problem in, in those communities. And in those communities, we are far from 100% adoption of these mitigations that matter. And as we start to step out with programs such as these, while there will be isolated places where they make sense, doing work on people's private property is tremendously problematic and difficult, laborious, time consuming, all of the above. And I, I just don't see, regardless of the amount of resources and money put against that problem, I just don't see a centralized solution being the answer for everyone. Now, it, it may be for a few, but I think the same is true of enforcement. As, as a, one of the questions mentioned, uh, neighborhood grassroots organizations such as Firewise and Fire Safe Councils are, are great ways for a community to organize and get work done. And the line, the conversation we have internally in the fire district is that as a Firewise community, once you've gotten organized and once you have done the work, if there are outliers who are either unable or unwilling to participate, give us a call after all the willing folks have done their work and we will come out with the enforcement mechanism and we will compel compliance on those few outliers. Right? But it's not where we want to start. It's where we want to end. I think it's the appropriate place for enforcement to close that last mile of the last several homes. I think the same probably holds true for home hardening and so forth. That the adoption, the thing holding us up from adoption right now is not a money issue in most communities. It's a will issue. And it's a belief that these things, one, will matter. Two, they will have a positive outcome for both fire and insurability uh, and all of the things associated with, with fire safety and, and understanding that as people come around to the idea that, that fire is not just something that happens in other places once or twice every several years. This is an annual recurrence and statistically it will occur in your neighborhood sometime soon. And I, and I would just, I would say for, for, for my community and many others, we have had the great gift of seeing other people suffer the effects of fire, which has given us the opportunity to recognize that this problem is here, it is now, it is not going away. And, and I, I believe, we, we all hope that we're not squandering that opportunity and that we have enough time remaining to adopt these mitigations that matter. But once again, that, that's mostly a matter of will in many areas. Not true for everyone, but, but I would say uh, for the majority, it's a matter of will, not resources. Can I ask a, maybe a, a question? It seems to me that there's technological possibilities to to get at this as well. I don't. I mean, you, it, it makes home hardening is is a is a is a word that means different things to different people. But I wonder if there's if the technology is something to be looking at, and also this idea of comparing communities. Uh, some of you know, Michael said that it's the richer communities that have made the adjustment. It's maybe maybe learning from that as a comparison. And actually the, the third related question is, what, what is the military? You guys know a lot about the military. I can see that plaque on Dave's wall there, but uh, is, there, is there something to be gained from looking at other sectors? It's just a, it's a question of you guys, sorry about that. No, certainly, it's a great question and I, I, it's very relevant. So um, th there, are, there are many fo smart folks working on this and there are many um, folks hoping for there to be a technological based solution. Uh, having spent a lot of time in this field and a lot of time watching fires burn, passive measures, uh, which are the simplest measures readily available now are the most effective. And, and there, is, uh, there are a number of technological adjuncts, um, be they autonomous swarms of, uh, swarms of drones or um, fire suppression systems or, or drop down fire curtains, all of these things um, which help, but by themselves, are simply not reliable enough, they're too expensive, and, and they rely on a whole bunch of things going right in the middle of a wildfire. And, and so the, the, the probability starts to drop off dramatically. If, if there's a power, the power is out either because of a PSPS or because of interruption of the lines, if cell phone service is, is available, if the um, water lines reaching, reaching the house have not been compromised, there's so much redundancy required and, and there are so many elements that have to go right for them to work that from my perspective, the low cost 
available passive measures uh, in the form of defensible space and home hardening are, are the space. And I, I would say just uh, for Donnie and I as, as Marine Corps infantry officers, uh, that holds true in the military as well. Uh, the, the, the satellites and the, the rockets and the airplanes uh, do not take and hold ground uh, the way an infantryman does. And, and when, all the, when all is said and done, uh, you still have a need for something decidedly low tech to carry the day. By the way, this is a great picture you have up. It's, that's the kind of, we have to publicize that a little more. <laughs> yeah, Dave and I at the time were both uh, both leading reconnaissance units at the same time on different sides of California. So um, we, that, that was how we, that, if you want a little of the backstory, that's how we first uh, first started working together and discussing this. Um, just briefly, what was talked about, we talked about home hardening. I wanted to throw up this uh, slide, which is from uh, one of the things that Mike had published uh, last year. And it just shows you, if you have a newer home that achieves the, the current home hardening standards, an older one that does not, and then you subject it to windblown ember cast, what it looks like. And that's a great example of why the home hardening is kind of critical. And, and to your point, John, is like, it's a great visual example I've seen to, to show what, what it means. Um, I think one of the things that we've repeated a couple of times here is just how a fire is an abstract problem. And Dave has hit on this, like insurance is an annual problem. So that seems like a good incentive way to target it. Um, what I'd be interested in maybe in asking John about is, you know, with your economic work, um, you've talked a lot about how to look at long-term economic results vice the short-term ones. And we see a lot of cases where someone comes up with a solution that's going to it's going to do something good in the short term, but it's not going to sustain that over the long term. And I think that's where I think the economic policy perspectives are really helpful here because there's a lot of ideas that says, well, this will stop the fire or this will suppress it or this will prevent that, but they don't solve the long-term problem. So maybe if you could kind of tell us a little bit about ideas on how to extend the short-term ideas to actual long-term economic benefits. Well, the way to, to do it is to demonstrate that your short-term decision has a long-term benefit. It is, the example of saving is the one I mentioned. Is you, you save for a longer time or save for one year. And I think that's the kind of thing that the mitigation of the mitigations are almost all long-term, as I understand that you, you get a hardened house that lasts for quite a while. So maybe maybe more emphasis on that. This is a longer term investment and it has payoffs. It's not just one year. It's not just a sort of thing. And most of the things I've heard you discuss are of that kind. So that, that's what I would emphasize. And I don't know if there's any comparisons of communities or anything you can demonstrate, but that somehow that the longer run, long issues are really the way to address this. And the short term is, is expensive and not that beneficial. So that's that's what I would say. Mike or Dave, do you want to do you want to talk about it, what you've seen on the short versus long term perspective there? Well, I I would just say that I think you know the the community level issues really are long term, and we need to be thinking about you know thirty year time horizons, um, and also where things are going to be in terms of fire risk in 10, 20, 30 years, because it's going to take us a while to achieve these objectives at the scale we need to, and we need to be prepared, you know, that, that for the fact that the wildfire situation could probably will be worse by the time we run the clock forward 10 or 20 years in the Western United States. And so we need to be building and retrofitting for that future. Right now, the insurance models, as good as they are, the cap models really are designed around a one year insurance contract because that's what they're built for. And we need models similar to those, but that have a longer time horizon that recognize that they're able to recognize the value of a short, an investment made today that pays dividends over 30 to 50 years. And that's a key area of research that we're undertaking actually within our group. And I think we're gonna see more of those models come to market for use in the public space um, over the next several years. Yeah, absolutely couldn't agree more. The uh, the, the long term payoff with the short term upfront cost is, is a it can be daunting, uh, particularly for for residents who have not budgeted for this before, are not either um, fiscally or mentally prepared uh, to make that investment. So understanding the long term and then reviewing the the regulatory elements, as as Mike alluded to, um, insurance policies can be written for no greater than twelve months. So, so it is not possible to, to amortize and to allocate a, a long-term return when you're locked into a 12-month contract um, that for which value cannot be provided beyond the length of the contract. 
So I, I think there are some elements there that, that require more discussion, more review uh, from a regulatory perspective to ensure that we are aligning um, our, our policies and the way in which insurance is being regulated in California with this reality. And, and I could not agree more that things are going to get worse. Um, the, the historical average in California was four to 12 million acres burned per year, depending on who you ask, uh, from Scott Stevens at, at UC Berkeley. In our worst years recently, we have just scratched the bottom end of that range with, with four and a quarter million acres burned per year. And if you look back over the last hundred years or so that there are records, uh, we almost never got into that range. So all of that, the, the returning to equilibrium is gonna involve millions and millions of acres seeing fire. And that's exclusive of the compounding effects of climate change. So I, I think it is crystal clear that this problem is going to get worse and, and we need to, stop building homes that we know that are going to burn while identifying ways that we can incentivize retrofits. And, and I think that is where the, the key piece lies, which speaks, it's a, it's a slight sidebar, but the, you know, the, the very maps that are regulating where buildings require ember resistant construction, those maps date from 2009. So the, we're, the, the maps we are using to, to guide the, the requirements to, to implement and to utilize ember resistant construction are 13 years out of date and couldn't possibly have foreseen the, the fire losses and the fire behavior we have seen in the last several years. Uh, fire has jumped the Pacific Crest twice that we know of. Uh, that was on the Dixie Fire and the Caldor Fire both last year. Right? So I, I think that's a harbinger of times to come. Uh, we will continue to see these fires and they're very likely to get worse. And, and, and because it's going to take time for for solutions to be implemented in the field at this scale on all the, the diversity of, of parcels and demographics and homes and the laborious door-to-door -door work and community organizing that will be required to result in uptake, we may find that by the time the best science that we know today is implemented, it may be obsolete. And so I think it's critical that we are, we are leaning into this and we are, we are readily recognizing that things will change and that we are adopting and modifying and, and evolving our, our standards and our best practices over time as the best fire science research comes back to, to recognize the changing environment in which we live. I'll throw this on the panel. We'll get several questions to talk about water resource management and drought management and water recapture and whether that's even being worked in or considered. And I, I don't think it is. I think when, especially when you look at California's aspect of the drought conditions, it's somewhat hard to map that. But I don't know if, if Mike or Dave has any uh, has any background knowledge on the water resource water capture aspects of the problem. I, having that, may a stretch, that may be a stretch, but I figured it's come up a couple of times, so I'd ask it. No, I think it's a great question. So the, the questions really had to do with do, uh, do stormwater capture systems that result in increased irrigation of, um, of vegetation around homes, are they helpful? And the answer is, Increasing the live moisture content of vegetative fuel is always helpful. Right? When, when things uh, exceed their moisture of extinction, they will not burn unless uh, the, the environment is so dry uh, that they're desiccated to the point that they will. And, and the fires that we typically are concerned about in California are wind-driven fall fires. When because of the Mediterranean client, climate, it could have been six months or more since there was measurable rainfall. And so those stormwater capture systems, while they allow more of the water to be stored and to be and allow for more uptake of the vegetation, six to nine months later, when the relative humidity is at 9% with 35 mile an hour winds out of the Northeast, uh, they're unlikely to have been effective to the point that that fuel will not burn. Everything will burn, steel will burn at 1300 degrees, right? So a well irrigated vegetation is more resistant to fire, but it is only more resistant, not fireproof. And so I, I think any of those systems, while, while useful to, to increase the health of the vegetation, uh, I, I personally would be very skeptical of, um, of live fuels next to my home that I was relying on, on them being well irrigated to protect the home. Yeah, and uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, this, this came up too, and maybe I'll start with John, but then, then roll to, to Mike and Dave on this, is we talked a little bit about, um, you know, we've tended to center on the incentive aspect of this, but obviously there's a stick side to it too. Um, so first, I think the first question to John is just, you know, what seems to work better in economic models, incentives or or penalties? And then if there is a consensus there, but then also maybe uh, to Dave and Mike, uh, one of the things that was brought up is, is 
uh, actual loss of individual of life, vice property, and whether or not criminal statutes would apply to that. Like if you didn't do this, would you be criminally liable? And then there's also aspects of like your standard fire inspections when they happen. And there's a wide difference between Southern and Northern California and enforcement of actual fuel mitigation. So I know that's a lot, but maybe, maybe ask my, uh, jump to John on penalties mm -hmm. versus incentives, and then Dave and, and, and Mike on, uh, on actually how that's actually applied from a criminal uh, penalty level. So it seems to me most of the examples that are, we're using to show how bad it is now, how worse it's gotten, are really, um, I don't think they're arson caused. It's, I don't know, maybe they are. Right. It seems to me it's it's other things. And so that would suggest that it's more the the rewards that you have to focus on, the people improving the situation. Um, and I think, you know, it, it requires a little bit of, of ingenuity and imagination of how to do that. I think this this re, this report, the catastrophic uh, model, catastrophe models, points in the right direction of where to make the rewards and how to do it. I mean, this is, again, the technology has is, is changed a lot. And so we can actually fine tune these things a little bit more. But the notion that if you do something to improve the safety of your neighborhood by fire resistance, somehow some reward from that seems to me that whatever it happens to be. So communities, larger groups of, of uh, people firefighting areas, I mean, it, it seems to me that's the way to is, is a little more on the reward side because it's a benefit that you're you're getting from this activity. Absolutely, and I I think as I, as we mentioned earlier on enforcement alone is not going to get us there. Aligning uh, incentives and rewards um, to beneficial outcomes and the good work it it takes to get there. I think that is it's something along those lines powered by private industry is what it's going to take to drive the, the speed, the scope and the scale of change that we need to, to stay at least, um, if not get ahead, at least keep a pace uh, of the changing fire environment. Uh, because we are talking about private property and particularly when we're talking about private property uh, on which people's homes are located, there are some very real, uh, appropriately, some very real restrictions on what we can do from an enforcement standpoint. Uh, yeah. We're regularly approached by, by residents who say, well, you should just go fix this problem. Uh, and as I'm sure we can all appreciate, the constraints on the government's ability to go on to private property in a non-consensual manner and carry out mitigation work in and around someone's homes are appropriately very tightly regulated. So tightly regulated that it is very difficult um, to achieve them. In Southern California, because they experienced traumatic loss from wildfire in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, there is much greater cultural acceptance of the requirement for unapologetic enforcement of the fire code. Uh, we are not there in Northern California. We also don't have the landscape that they have in Southern California, which lends itself to these measures because of the different fuel models. It is a very different approach to prepare a, home, a community and, and homes in that community to receive fire from brush covered slopes of inland Southern California. That is a very different scenario than the, the timber and the light flashy fuels and the grasses that we see surrounding Northern California communities. So uh, while the cultural acceptance of unapologetic enforcement, uh, I think is, is absolutely the model to be followed and Southern California has absolutely led the way on a number of these things. Um, it is going to be slightly more challenging in Northern California because of the heavier fuel models the increased fuel loads and the, and the rapid spread rates. That said, it can certainly be done. And I think there's a great deal to, to be learned from the way Southern California has become culturally more accepting of this. I just add one additional point about the Northern versus Southern California difference that I think is important, which is, and, and this kind of enforcement dynamic. I think that people in Northern California often do not realize the level of landscape change that has occurred in their neighborhood over the last 100 years, even the last 50 years. And when you show them photographs of what the landscape looked like prior to its subdivision and you know, prior to the point where homes were built on it, they're generally quite astonished, right? Because the ranchers that mostly ran cattle on these land, you know, that the land was logged after the Indians were, were extirpated, the land was logged. Then very often land was ranched and ranchers 
at the time regularly used prescribed fire to improve their rangeland. They still do like important partners. I've worked on legislation around prescribed fire liability um, and, you know, key partners with the prescribed fire people in that work were the, the ranching community in California. And I'll tell you, and, and I'll tell you, there could not be two more different constituencies. Um, and so, you know, and, and as soon as houses get built, though, and people are watering their yards, trees grow. And so you just get this rapid transformation. I don't think people fully understand that. Um, it's not going to remove their desire for privacy, you know, for a green leafy place. But I think when you show that to them, it begins, it, it helps people to kind of get jogged out of the sense they have the, the, the mistake that, that, that many people make that where they assume that things have always been as they are, because they really just have not been right. You know, um, the example I like to use is Kentfield where, uh, governor Newsom used to live before he moved to Sacramento and in Kentfield, um, you know, in the early 1900s, fuel loads were something on the order of 20 tons per acre, and now they're up at 120 tons per acre, right? And that's the difference between logging followed by ranching and homes. Um, and, and I think we need to educate as much as we enforce, right? We need to teach people about the risks that may not be obvious to them, but that are really are, are life safety risks for, for themselves and their families. Um, and, and, and that can be part of a solution too, is really just changing the level of knowledge and information, good information from trusted providers. And, and the nice thing there is, you know, people trust firefighters. They really do. Um, and, you know, I'm, uh, my brother-in-law was a firefighter for a long time. And he used to say that, you know, he was very lucky relative to the police because he could actually eat the cookies that people gave him, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I think, I think we're lucky in this space to have a really trusted information provider. And so we just need to make sure that they have the time and resources and materials to provide really compelling information to the residents that they serve. And my great point, I think one statistic I meant to mention earlier is uh, when you look at um, before Native Americans were moved, they were doing controlled burns, which amounted between natural burns and controlled burns uh, run by the tribes amount to about four and a half million acres a year. And if you look at it with the exception of like 2020, was the one year where we approached four and a half million burned acres. So all these catastrophic fires have not even approached the natural fires that used to exist and used to thin that landscape. And that's part of it. When you say, when you look at those two differences, it's, it's, it's pretty stark to see how the landscape used to look, uh, look to now. So um, go ahead. Go ahead. You, I was just saying you a great, oh, sorry, after you, Professor Taylor. No, I just as, a, as more of a question. So uh, Northern and Southern California, a lot of us are near Silicon Valley and these firms are leaving to go to Texas. I can't believe it's a better climate there. But uh, is there is there things where we talk about homeowners, but there's a lot of, also a lot of businesses that uh, are threatened by this. Is that something that we could focus on? Uh, you could focus on more um, you know, there are new technologies all the time being developed, but I haven't heard much about this side of it at all. A really interesting case study is the, the, wine, the wine industry in Napa, where um, concentrated values at risk, uh, exposure to wildfire, not only to wildfire, but to smoke. Uh, the, the crop can only take so much smoke before it is ruined. Uh, and some really interesting innovation is coming out of that space uh, because they have a clear imperative to act and, and businesses tend to be earlier adopters because the, the financial proposition is better understood because they are running a business. So um, industry is doing things, industry that's exposed to wildfires doing things in this space. And some of it is very interesting. And I believe some of it uh, will be the genesis of emerging technologies that will have widespread applications in the near future. I think with that, um, we're getting close to time. So maybe I'll just rotate to the panelists to kind of just put a final thought out there and then uh, and then we'll close it up. So. Maybe if I can start with you, John, if you have anything to kind of wrap up on. I think I'll just sort of repeat this idea that the basic ideas of externalities that have been around a long time. Uh, we try to reduce those in various ways. It's not just fire. Fire is really before us now, but it's in all areas of economics. And so that's, I think that I would stress that. Look at, look at new technology, look at ways to define what's an externality, how to find private solutions, but ultimately uh, that should be the focus. Mike? Um, 
I just say, you know, I think a theme that's run through this and sort of come to the surface a few times, but I hope that people walk away from, you know, thinking about more is that the idea that we're going to put all fires out is just not connected to reality. It's not connected to science. And the key challenge that we face as a society in California is learning how to live with fire, how to choose the fire we want to have, rather than having that choice imposed upon us in really catastrophic outcomes. And, and so, you know, part of what we need to do, or a huge part of what we need is just change our whole outlook to this problem, maybe move in the direction of, of the Native Americans, but that used to live here, um, but, and still do in some places, but um, but we need to do that in a context with 40 million people and enormous fixed assets that we can't move around. And so it's a huge challenge, but that's, I think that's the fundamental challenge. Thanks, Mike. Dave? I, I couldn't agree more. Fire, fire is here. Fire is supposed to be here. Yet we are here as well. And, and learning to live with fire and building resilient communities that will increase our ability to allow beneficial fire to burn increase our comfort level through the resiliency of our community with managing fire rather than eliminating fire and driving the adoption of these known and accessible defensible space and home hardening mitigations, understanding that the work we do to protect our home and our family implicates the survivability of the homes and families around us and, and taking this community level view and aligning those economic incentives so the choice architecture is clear. If I don't do this, it will have a negative outcome for me and my family not in some abstract distant future when a fire might burn through here, but instead within the next year when the policies to ensure my home and my neighbor's homes come up for renewal. And understanding the interconnected manner in which all of our homes have the ability to spread fire to the surrounding homes and viewing this as a civic duty to prepare your home and your parcel, I think that is the key to driving the adoption of these well understood, low cost, high impact mitigations that matter. Thanks, Dave. I think that was a, a great wrap up to, to a really great panel. Um, I will uh, have a couple of questions about the slides. We'll prep those as well as some of the resources and uh, links that we've spoken about throughout here. We'll wrap that up in an email and shoot it out to those who have uh, joined us today. Um, first, I'd really like to thank all of our panelists, um, Dr. Taylor, uh, Dr. Wara, and then Dave Winokur uh, for joining us today. Uh, brought a lot of great insight and a lot of great perspective to this problem. I'd also like to thank the Hoover Institution for sponsoring this as well as our co-sponsor, the Moore Foundation, who is uh, both of us have been dedicated to finding solutions to these complex challenges that are really gonna benefit the people of California and ideally the, the rest of the United States as well. So with that, really appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, thanks so much for the great questions and the great engagement. And uh, we look forward to, to sharing some more research with you all in the future. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It's great. Mm -hmm.